Good morning and welcome to today's Real Estate Default Group's referral workshop. Uh, my name is Casey Hicks and I'm a shareholder here at Weltman working out of the Chicago office and I'm also the newly appointed chair of the firm's Real Estate Default Group. Today I'm joined with uh, by two of my colleagues, Megan and Greg. Good morning guys. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so before we get started, I'm going to have Megan and Greg introduce themselves. And first, we'll start off with you, Megan. Hi, everyone. My name is Megan Katz. I am an associate attorney with the Real Estate Default Group. I am currently at the Cleveland location, and I've been with the firm for over two years now, and I am licensed to practice in the state of Ohio. Great. Thank you, Megan. And Greg, what about you? Yes, yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Greg Sizeki. I'm a senior attorney at the Development Real Estate Default Group. I practice in our Chicago office and I'm licensed to practice in the states of Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin. Great. Thank you, Greg. Um, so before we get started, for everyone out there, we're going to go through just a few housekeeping items. Um, as a reminder, this is an interactive session, so please submit any questions that you have throughout the presentation um, through the question button in the control panel. We will try to answer as many questions as we can throughout today's webinar. If we don't get to answer your question live, one of us will follow up with you after today's session. Um, also, as a reminder, today's webinar is being recorded, and at the conclusion of today's session, there will be a link to the recording sent to you as well as a copy of today's presentation. We will also be sending out a short survey at the conclusion of this event. We encourage you to fill out the survey and we appreciate any good or bad feedback so we can improve for the future. And if you have any topics that you would like to see us discuss going forward, please include those in the survey. Uh, we greatly appreciate hearing your opinions um, on all of our webinars so that we can keep giving you good content. Um, and without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And I'm gonna throw it back to you, Megan, to kick us off. All right, thanks so much, Casey. So when we're looking at starting a foreclosure referral, um, there's a lot of things that we have to take into consideration and me as well as Greg are gonna be talking about those throughout this presentation. But one of the things we always look at when we get a referral to our department is the 120 day rule. Now this is a rule that's part of Regulation X um, as part of RESPA as well. It requires that the first filing under state foreclosure laws cannot occur until after 120 days have passed from the date of default. So in other words, we cannot file a complaint until the 121st day of the borrower being in default. Now, what does this delinquency date look like? How do we determine this? Um, we look at this as the first date that payment is due but not paid. So if we had, let's say the payment is due on May 1st, um, we're looking at May 2nd as the delinquency date if they meet, if they do not meet that May 1st deadline. So this applies to both judicial and non-judicial foreclosures, and it also applies to non-payment related breaches. Um, this rule also, sorry. <laughs> That's okay, no, you're good. Um, this rule also applies to all federally backed loans, loans from institutions insured by the FDIC, and it also applies to small servicers, including servicers fewer than 5,000 mortgage loans. So I'm assuming some of you out there in our presentation audience. Um, there are some exceptions to the 120 day rule, and these are always exceptions that we look at when we get a referral for foreclosure. We always evaluate the situation and don't just assume that the rule applies. We like to look at the circumstances case by case to make sure that we're proceeding in the best way that we can. Some of these exceptions include that the loan was a temporary loan, such as a construction loan, the home isn't a one to four unit family dwelling, the unit isn't a state or territory in the United States, or one that's somewhat frequent in, in some of the work that I do, the foreclosure is caused by a due on sale clause in the mortgage contract. So for example, if the owner of the property who is on the note and mortgage sells the property to another person without the lender agreeing, then we can trigger the due on sale clause and demand that the entire payoff is immediately due and payable. Now, we always look to these exceptions and communicate with our clients to let them know whether they apply or not, but if none of these exceptions are in play, then we have to work with 120 day rule and wait until that expires before we proceed with foreclosure. Great, thank you, Megan. Now, Greg, could you tell us what documentation we need when a referral is sent over to our group? Yes, yes, thank you, Megan. Casey, yes, uh, in, in order to, if if and when you are ready to send uh, the foreclosure referral to our law, law firm, which we really appreciate, uh, we, we made a, we will provide you with a, our for, a template foreclosure referral sheet. It's a fillable PDF document that we will 
that we've created to streamline and make the referral process most most efficient. Uh, the, as you go and fill out the form, it will it will ask for basic loan information, loan numbers, social security numbers, address of the borrowers. If you have an alternate address for the borrower, for any of the borrowers, please let us know. Well, we do our own skip skip traces for the borrowers to confirm addresses, but any information, obviously, that you can provide to us ahead of time is 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 uh, welcome and helpful. Um, also, let us know what you believe your lien position is. Um, sometimes we, we do our own title searches, obviously, in the, in, the, in the foreclosure process. But if you and sometimes old loans, perhaps unreleased mortgages may may pop up. But we just want to make sure that we're on the same page. If you believe you're in the first position and there's some older older mortgage, perhaps on the title, we'll, we'll let you know. Um, if there's an investor on the on the loan, please let us know that that as well. Um, and as far as documents go, there's the standard documents that we like you to provide copies of. We don't need originals, uh, the copy of the note and any allonges or or uh, endorsements, copy of the mortgage, uh, any loan modification or deferral documents. If there was a deferment, please let us know about that as well. That, that issue may come up later. Um, and also, uh, current payoff figures, reinstatement figures for the loan, we, we need those for our foreclosure complaint. And if there is requests for payoff or reinstatement letters from the borrowers, um, but obviously we will communicate that as well with you. Um, less peri uh, the less monthly periodic statement, if you have one, if one was be if, if statements were being mailed to to the borrower, that is helpful for us, as I will talk about about this later for the M MVN notice. Um, if you have a complete, if it's easier for you to provide a complete loan history, that is helpful for us to have at the outset of the case as well. Um, and then we'll, I will also talk a little bit later about the demand letter. If you send out your own demand letter, please let us know and provide us a copy. And if you have proof of, proof of the mailing, that would that would be helpful as well uh, to show that it was that it was mailed, in fact, and what date and how it was mailed. Um, if there are any pre-suit notices that are state specific that you mail out yourself, please let us know and give us provide us with a copy as well. Um, if if the borrower any of the borrowers is deceased and you have a at least the information about the de date of death, or if you have the copy of the death certificate, that would also be very helpful. Uh, we, when we do our skip skip traces, skip searches for the borrowers, some of the date of that information does come up. Uh, we are also able to get a debt certificate on you uh, for you if you if one is not available. Uh, if you have a title policy, and also if it's not that hard for you to provide, please uh, uh, please give us a copy. We'll save it to the file, and if any issues with title come up, we'll we'll have it ready for 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 that. And here for everyone out there, here's a, a copy of our foreclosure referral form, and that will be sent out to everyone today at the conclusion of the presentation with a copy of our deck. Um, also, any referrals for foreclosure, those can be sent to Weltman at fcreferrals uh, at weltman.com, and that's for any state um, that you have a referral for, they can be sent to that email address. Additionally, while your case is pending with us, we have a global support email address that's right there on the screen for you, and you can email any questions that you have um, about that your pending case with us to that email address so they can be responded to promptly. And with that, I'm going to kick it back over to you, Greg, for demand letters. Okay, and just to, to uh, expand a little bit on, on what the documents what documents are needed and what what uh, what we do for for our clients as well is is uh, we review all the documents obviously uh, that client provides in detail. If client sends sends out their own demand letter, uh, we make sure that the demand letter is uh, correct and proper it, uh, that it tracks the terms of the mortgage uh, because that's one of the one of the issues that foreclosure defense attorneys try to exploit. If if the demand letter is not not um, 100% correct, I would say. It has to. There's very little room for error, error on the demand letter. Uh, a lot of uh, different law lenders, different lawyers call this document by different names. Uh, some call it the demand letter, uh, breach notice, uh, breach letter, notice of default, default or notice of intent to accelerate. But it is the same document. It's required by most mortgages. Uh, the mortgages uh, provide how it's supposed to be sent, when, how much time the borrower is, is given, should be given. Uh, to cure the default. Um, if if the client prefer, pre uh, prepares their own demand letter, like I said, we review it, make sure it's correct. If it's not, 
we'll let you know and we'll we'll point out some of the deficiencies that might be there um we we um as, as a law firm we sent the demand letter to each person that signs the mortgage sometimes we find that lenders uh, believe they only need to send the demand letter to the person who signed the note but in most states and most mortgages the note the this demand letter should be mailed to each each person that signed the mortgage and most most uh, mortgages mortgage terms provide for 30 day 30 day deadline for the homeowner to cure the default uh, our law firm is is um, proactive and risk averse obviously as, as your attorneys we want to um, avoid any potential issues or or problems that foreclosure defense attorneys could exploit so we provide 33 days in our more in, in our demand letters this this pro provides for the three days approximately three days for the mail to reach the borrower this way the borrower gets a full 30 days to reinstate or cure the default and we avoid any potential issues that foreclosure defense attorneys could exploit um okay we have a sample we have a sample uh template letter that you will see as at the next slide and this letter closely follows the fannie mae freddie mac uniform mortgage language regarding what is supposed to uh, what a demand letter is is required to contain so um that's for many of our loans obviously well, your, our, many of our clients loans which are freddie Fannie Mae or, or freddie mac uh uniform uh type of documents this this uh template letter works for those loans but we take care to review your loan documents make sure that whatever letter we send, whenever we send it, um, that it that it closely tracks the terms of the mortgage. We also, one last thing, uh, mail the letter by certified and regular mail. Some mortgages uh, require regular mail. Some mortgages require certified mail. So that we cover all bases and send it by both. Thank you, Greg. Now we have a couple state specific requirements here on the next slide. Yes. So difference as we are a national where we our law firm provides national coverage for for all types of creditors rights, including foreclosure. Uh, we are familiar with different state specific requirements. So if, if you as a lender have, have accounts in different states, we're able to provide you with guidance as far as what is needed in each state so that all these pre suit requirements are fulfilled for example indiana north carolina new york and new jersey they have their own requirements specific requirements which which require additional notice registration property preservation information that needs to be provided so we will guide you through that process if you're not familiar with that particular state and one one more additional notice that we as a law firm uh, being deemed a, a debt collector need to send out is the model val validation notice, the MVN notice. And as I mentioned earlier in the uh, list of documents, if you could provide us with the most current periodic monthly statement for the loan, we can just attach that to this notice. We mail out this notice at the same time in the same manner as our demand letter to, to, to the person, uh, at least for this one, only to the person who signed the note, because that person is the the borrower, the person uh, liable for the for the debt, uh, personally liable. So we send it out along with with any demand letter to the borrower who signed the note. We also provide additional time uh, for the borrower to get this potential dispute back to us. So we provide 40 days, but this notice does not stop us from proceeding with the foreclosure. As soon as the demand letter 30 day deadline, 33 day 33 day deadline expires, we can proceed unless we get a dispute back from the borrower. And then two samples we have here, Greg, right? Yeah, so one sample, which is much easier and quicker, is, is where we can attach, just attach the monthly periodic statement. We don't have to do any calculations or manual entry. So it just simplifies the process, makes it quicker. And then the other sample, it's, it's not, a, not a big, obviously, problem if you don't, if for some reason the, the monthly statements are not being generated for the particular loan on the next sample we just have the mvn notice where we manually where we manually in, input the 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 figures the, the amounts that are due and owing on the loan that you provide to, provide to us and we obviously ask you 
with you know if there's any if there are any questions any additional information that we may we may need we'll ask you we'll communicate with you thank you great thank you Craig that was a lot of great information um, now we're going to move on to our last topic of the day um, which Megan's going to talk about referrals for protective answers and or cross claims. Yes, thank you, Casey, and thank you, Greg. Um, so, so Greg just talked a lot about what happens when you want to initiate a foreclosure proceeding, when a lender finds that a borrower is in default and they want to bring a complaint before the court. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about a slightly different situation where let's say the lender for whom you work is named in a foreclosure proceeding that was initiated by another lender or another lien holder against the same borrower regarding the same property. Now, when these situations arise, it is absolutely imperative for a lender who who has an interest in the property to file an answer because this notifies the court that you have this interest in the property and when it comes time to judgment for the plaintiff they won't default your interest out at judgment and you will be able to preserve your interest in the property and obtain proceeds of the sale depending on how your system works in whatever state the property locate is located so it's important to file an answer but there's two different types of answers that you can look at as options for filing when you're named in a complaint. And we're gonna go over the differences between the two. The first is called a protective answer. This is basically a notice pleading that functions purely for the purposes of letting the court know and letting the parties in the complaint filing know that you just want to preserve your interest in the property and you're just responding to the complaint with which you were served, but you're not raising a separate claim against the borrower or any other parties in the proceeding. You're just letting the court know, hey, I have this interest in the property please do not default me out at judgment and if there isn't any interest in the sale I would like proceeds if they're available. Um, because this is just for the purposes of responding to the plaintiff's complaint, our firm offers a one lump sum fee for the purposes of filing the answer and then moder monitoring the case to make sure there's nothing further that's needed and just checking the status and progress. So it's a little bit less expensive. This is typically an option that's used when the borrower isn't in default, when you're looking at whether to respond, like when you're looking at how to respond to a complaint um, because you're not raising a claim that the borrower is owing you any amount of money it's you know they're they're current so this is most likely the option you would want to use um conversely though if the initial complaint is dismissed against you know the borrower maybe they resolve it somehow you don't have any remaining claim that you can bring against the borrower if circumstances arise your protective answer is also effectively dismissed and the case is effectively closed um, on the flip side of that, our second option to look at is our answer cross-claim. Now, this essentially functions as an answer addressing the claims that were brought up in the other lender's complaint, the plaintiff's complaint, but also bringing your own separate complaint, so to speak, a claim against the borrower or maybe another party, but most often for our purposes, the borrower, because there's some sort of default or delinquency. Um, this is most often used where maybe you were preparing to file a complaint against the borrower and then someone else beat you to the punch because they're in default. Or maybe um, there's a part of the mortgage that says that even when the borrower isn't delinquent, you're able to bring a cross claim against them if there was a foreclosure proceeding initiated by another lien holder. Now, because we basically have to do the same things that we would normally do in a complaint in this cross claim, we're ordering title, we're doing a notice of acceleration as Greg just descri described uh, previously, we're basically going to be looking at the same fee schedule that we would normally do for a complaint referral. So it's a little bit more expensive than a protective answer, but it also allows you to proceed for judgment, your own judgment, against the borrower independent of what the plaintiff is doing in their case. So it allows you to obtain your own judgment and regardless of maybe even if the complaint gets dismissed by the plaintiff, you can still proceed and the cross claim will still survive and you can obtain your own judgment regardless of what's going on with the other case. So what happens if you're named in a complaint, right? You you get this you know, service document trying to figure out how to proceed. Well, it's really important when you are named in a complaint or you lent the company for which you work is named in a complaint to refer it to our Weltman REDG referral inbox, which is listed here on the slideshow as soon as possible so that we can take the, op the um, action necessary to file a response and protect your interest. Now, as Greg mentioned, you know, there's a referral sheet that we had on our slideshow and that will be sent out to all of you. The additional loan documents, the note, the mortgage, and any other information that you think would be important to our firm to understand how to proceed in this situation in the best way. 
Timing is also everything with answers. It's really important to note that there are time constraints that we need to adhere to in order to best protect your interest. In the state of Ohio where I practice, there is 28 days from the date of service of the complaint on the party in order to file a timely answer. Um, and there are similar time constraints in other states as well. Um, so we want to make sure as much as possible that we are filing our response to the complaint within that 28 day period. Now let's say you get a copy of the complaint, it maybe gets lost in the shuffle, and you realize once it comes across your desk that we're past that 28-day time frame. That doesn't necessarily mean that we still can't file into the case and protect your interest. We just have to do something called seeking leave of the court and perhaps also communicating with plaintiff's counsel to see if they'll consent to us filing leave to answer. Um, and as, we, as long as we get that leave, we're still able to have an answer that's considered timely in participating in the proceedings to protect your interest. I will say though, just as a word of caution, the longer we wait, from the answer period expiring, that 28 day period, to answer into the proceedings, the further we get along in this foreclosure case without answering, the harder it might be, depending on the judge, depending on the magistrate, depending on the circumstances of the case, to actually obtain leave. Like if we're past judgment or something, depending on the circumstances, it might be harder than let's say if we're like five days past the 28 day deadline. So it's always very important, the main takeaway, is to get this to us as soon as possible so that we can assist you in protecting your interest. And then just one final note, because you know circumstances might change in a proceeding when you're trying to figure out whether to file a protective answer or an answer cross-claim. Circumstances might change that might make you feel differently about the case or how to proceed in the case depending on what happens after you file that answer. So let's say, for example, the borrower was current when you were served with a copy of this complaint and you decide to file a protective answer because you know the borrower is current. Why would you wanna raise a claim against them? But in the time afterwards, the borrower does fall into default and maybe they're past that 120 day time period and you're looking to bring your own cross claim against them. We can certainly help with that and file a motion to amend to reflect an answer cross claim. Um, conversely, let's say when you were filing the complaint, the borrower was in default and you wanted to bring a cross claim as well as answering against the borrower because you wanted to obtain judgment against them. But in the time after you filed that answer cross, the borrower either you know resolves the case by with you by reinstating, loss mitigation, some sort of option, and you want to let the court know that you're no longer pursuing this cross claim against them, we can file a notice of dismissal as to specifically the cross claim, but make it known to the court that we still want to make maintain our interest in the proceedings with the complaint and the plaintiff. And you know, if there's any proceeds of whatever sale that we still want to maintain an interest in that. So just to kind of reinforce whatever decision you make at the beginning of the process, if there are changes in circumstances, we can absolutely help you and accommodate you in this case. We just need to make sure you communicate with us and let us know what's going on and we can best assist you. So main takeaways, Move quickly with an answer and make sure you communicate with your lawyers because we'll be able to figure out a solution to assist you in the best way that we can. Great, thank you so much, Megan. We did have a couple of questions come in while you guys were chatting and educating us. So the first one um, was, is Weltman able to assist if the borrower files bankruptcy during this process? And the question is, yes, absolutely. We have a bankruptcy department here at Weltman that also uh, covers the entire country. So if there is a bankruptcy filing during the foreclosure, yes, we can definitely assist. Um, the other question that we received was, what should we do if a borrower contacts our office after Weltman has reached out to them? Um, I would suggest you're definitely going to want to let us know, especially if the borrower is requesting reinstatement or payoff figures, you're going to want us to know and fulfill that request for you so we can make sure all of your court costs and attorney's fees are included in that payoff or reinstatement quote. Um, with that, I don't see any other questions. Um, oh, one more actually. Um, if I had a question on a current situation, who can I reach out to? You guys can reach out to me, Greg or Megan, and our contact information is right here for you guys. And um, it will be included with the deck that you guys sent out after um, today's presentation. So with that, I think that's all the questions that we got. Um, 
so thank you everyone so much for attending today's webinar. We hope that you found this uh, information informative. And if you do have any questions, please feel free to e reach out to either one of us after today today's session. Um, also, as a reminder, please complete the survey um, so we know how you felt about this and we can always improve. And if you have any other topics that you would like to hear us discuss, we would be um, happy to hear those. Um, and thank you again and have a great rest of the day. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.